Support for Kalamazoo Lively Arts is provided by the Irving S. Gilmore Foundation, helping to build and enrich the cultural life of greater Kalamazoo. Welcome to Kalamazoo Lively Arts, the show that takes you inside Kalamazoo's vibrant, creative community and explores the people who breathe life into the arts. I'm John Koch here at Miller Auditorium. On today's show, we stop by Heritage Guitar to meet Rendell Wall of the Green Valley Boys and learn about the fiber arts with Terry Felt of the Weavers Guild of Kalamazoo. So Terry, we're here with your spinning wheel. Yes, we and are. And tell me what you're doing. Tell me what the piece is that's here. Okay, I have a piece of roving and it's been commercially dyed and I'm making one ply of yarn. So this big thick piece becomes a real thin Yes, and you can see there's a lot of opening air in here. Yeah. And once it's yarn, there's not. And so there's still some air in there. If I relax it a little bit, it gets a bit wider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right now I'm spinning to the right, which is the proper way, um, way back when they were looking for ways to tell whether a woman was a witch or not. If you mm. spun to the left, that was an indication you were a witch. Oh. And so now you spin to the right to spin to create the yarn and the left to ply it. And as long as you spin in those directions, nobody will accuse you of being a witch. <laughs> how, do you, how does one even begin spinning? Well, I took a spinning class um, locally and then um, went to the Weaver's Guild and we also have a spinning group in it. We meet, that group meets once a month at one of the public libraries. And so if you're a new spinner, you can go there and there's so many people that will help you perfect your skill and it's a great way to exchange ideas, find out about materials that are both locally available for shepherds around here and then where you can buy it online also. Is there a piece that you made that like you were just so proud of it when you finally finished it, something that just even, just you look at and you just think, wow, I did that. Well, my most recent sweater is a piece I'm very proud of. I spun all the yarn um, from the, what we collected together and then I designed the sweater and I knit it. So it, it worked out. I feel like I started, I didn't raise the sheep. Right. <laughs> but from there on, I did all the work in it. So yeah. that was really fun. Yeah. And I, yeah. Go ahead, I was going to say, and I also didn't dye the robings. Yeah. Because so, yeah. animals don't come in those colors. Right. Now, now, does this break? Does that ever break when you're doing this? Yes, like that. Yes. And so then I will just lay it off to the side and kind of feather some new th strands back into it. Just and keep going. My fear was on TV it wouldn't come back <laughs> together, and it didn't come back very well. Let me try one more time. Get up here where it's just a little thicker. I have more strands of wool to work with. Because it's just kind of like becoming one as it's twisting, right? It is, yep. And now nobody will know except that it's recorded on TV that it ever was broken. <laughs> and you know, I, I asked you about this because you said that this is, this is wool that came from... I, I'm almost positive it came from Sweden. Right, and when I was holding it, and, and kept doing this, you said, you know, that's how they make felt. Yes. And, and you said, don't do that too much. Right, <laughs> it exactly. Feels, it almost feels, I don't know, waxy or oily or something. That's the natural lanolin in it. And so one of the things when you spin with wool that hasn't been processed as much as this is, it's almost like putting hand cream on your hands all the time. Yeah, it feels good. It feels good. And so if you don't wash it clean, that has a water repellency and even wool that's clean takes 30 minutes to get wet. So, which would keep the sheep warm, warm when but, it's raining and, or snowing, right? But it also keeps us warm if it's yes, raining or snowing. Yes. And I don't know if you're old enough to remember when all the mittens were wool and then you'd come in from the playground, put them on the heat <laughs> register, like the radiators, and over the course of the winter, your mittens would keep getting smaller and smaller and oh. kind of thicker and thicker because the, the wool in the mitten was actually felting. Yeah. I love the way this smells. Isn't that weird? Oh, and I just love the way it feels. Yeah. There's something 
Oh, you it's are. It's like a dick tub. I baby. know. <laughs> I know. I fear that. So, Terry, when you think of spinning, when you thought of spinning, why does it light your fire? Why do you get so excited about it? Well, two reasons. One, I enjoy being able to make something, and I really enjoy the community of weavers and spinners that I've gotten to know because of being involved with that. It, um, I like hearing what other people are doing, and one of the asides from making things is also it's a, a tremendously supportive community. And so if there's something going on in your personal life, you have people that are really interested in that. And I have friends that are in their 20s, and one of our members, who I consider a friend, is over 100 years old. Wow. So you have that full range of ages and experiences to share, and I enjoy that. So, so this is a leader, and this is just cotton yarn. It could be wool. It, it really doesn't matter, but mine happened to be cotton. And that just kind of keeps them both yeah. together. Yep, and so it'll take a minute for it to catch on. Whoops. And oh, let me get some tension on that, and that'll work better. Once it's tensioned, you see the bobbin doesn't it spins differently. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. And so this now would be what I would consider finished yarn. Sometimes I have some pieces of work, you know, art that I have. They have like little bumps in them. Mm -hmm. Is that where they attach something? Is that where the where Sometimes. crimped or? Or I can make a little bump just like that. Yeah, oh, okay. So I like that, it adds texture. Yep. So that's just a case of sliding it down and making, and then you can decide how much you want to slide on there. Right. Question. Yes. Let's say you have, I have a sweater like this. I bought it this way. It, somebody obviously shrunk the sweater by accident. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that I can never get that? I don't need it to be real loose, but a little looser than what it is? There's a way to get it looser. You may not be able to get it back to the size it had been originally. Yeah. But if you soak it in Epsom salt, a lot of times that will relax it a little bit. And so then you can just kind of reshape it. It's called blocking and pulling it out and so that you can kind of adjust the sleeve and it, if the fronts are kind of cockeyed, yeah, you, can, yeah, yeah. you can level them back out. Is there a way to not make it so picky? If you buy a picky sweater, then um, I suggest that you, whatever cream rinse you use for your hair, that you put that on the like sweater. Like a conditioner? Yes, and uh. so that you're essentially conditioning the wool like you are conditioning your hair. I'm learning so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you've spun for a long time, this is why the spinning group is so much fun. Everybody has little tips like they that that you can try. Things, right? yeah. I bet that 100-year-old lady has a ton of them, right? She does. <laughs> Here we are in the Heritage Guitar Studios, where they make guitars, but they also make history. We're going to have a conversation with Renda Wall. We're going to have him take us back in time. The Green Valley Jamboree. Do you know that that was the longest country running TV show in history? Right here in Kalamazoo. All right, Renda Wall, I understand we're in a Picking Lounge. This, is, have, this is Rundle's Picking Lounge. Where have you Picking Parlor, us? whatever you want to call it. <laughs> What's happening in your life? Yeah. Well, I tell you what, uh, I'm getting a little older every day as we all are, but it's fun to come to work. It's fun to uh, see the smile on the faces of people that come in here and, and uh, look at these beautiful heritage guitars and pick them up and play them, plug them in the amp and have a good time. That's what this place is for. Uh, heritage was uh, has uh, been around here since uh, 85. We incorporated in, in uh, April Fool's Day of 85. On purpose, right? Yeah, on purpose, yeah. And uh, the fellows that were uh, with Gibson and myself, uh, uh, the three, uh, the four of them, uh, J.P. Motes and Marvin Lamb and, and Jim Derlew and Bill Page, uh, got together and, and formed the corporation back then. Uh, and we've, we've since grown tremendously. We got. A lot of new equipment, of course, a new space, as you can see, and uh, we're just having a big, big old time. That's what music's all about. You bet. Do we blame it all on mom and dad? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they got me started when I was out of diapers. Okay. And uh, uh, got me playing the accordion, and then they got me playing the steel guitar and lap steel and a little piano. Never did get onto the piano too much, but the lap steel guitar and then drums and bass and doing a little singing. And then, of course, we had the TV show for 37 years and the radio for 40 years in the Kalamazoo area. So it's, it's been fun. Mm -hmm. Music is, is my, our life. Yeah. And now from
from TV Active 3, it's time once again for the Green Valley Jamboree. A full half hour of your favorite country music. And now, here's Rem. Well, let's just go down a little bit of memory lane. What is this scrapbook? Is this, uh, this better be kept under lock and key there, Rem. Yeah, I keep this pretty well to myself, and once in a while I'll pull it out and share it with folks, and that's what we're doing now. Yeah, so. is this the band? Yeah, this is my dad's band, the Rem Wall and Green Valley Jamboree. That's uh, my dad here, and then Hubie Fryer, he's still with us. Mm -hmm. And Howie Quibell, Jim Bradford, and Billy Band. Um, that's, that's the original group. B.B. King? Uh, Wait, B.B. King? Yeah, B.B. King. I don't know if you can focus in on that. You'd have to get pretty close, but there's B.B. King and uh, Larry London on drums. An mm -hmm. old friend of mine, one of the best drummers in Nashville. Now, how did you get that connection? When, when I was with the Gibson, they wanted me to deliver B.B. King's guitar, so I did. And B.B. also has two of my inventions. One of them is a TP6. Right there? Yeah, this is the TP6 that I invented in 78. Uh, for Gibson, and uh, it also has the Sustain Sisters on it that I invented that for Gibson. And take us back, put the hat on of your memories of the, your dad playing in the yeah, in well, the band. Yeah, Dad started the band in, in the 40s. Name of it was? Rimwall and the Green Valley Jamboree. And uh, Dad used to play down at Leonidas and with the band a lot in the Leon Ballroom down there. And then he got on WKZO radio and television later on. And we were on television for 30, over 35 years. Now you say we, were you involved too? Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah back back when they, uh, yeah, right when I was uh, just 10 years old. And I was on the show playing, learning to play drums. And, and then later on, I, I steel guitar, bass, guitar, sang. And uh, at one time I had a keyboard and the pedals on the floor, and a guitar, and Mike and did a one-man act for, for a few years. And then back my dad, and uh, we had a duo act for, for quite a while. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things that over, the, over my lifetime has been a thrill for me is artist relation. Because with Gibson and Heritage, uh, I got to sign, like Roy Clark for Heritage. Uh, uh, most people have heard of Roy, he's, he's getting up there like I am, but uh, he's still picking and grinning, as they say, he was on Hee Haw for many years. Saturday night. But every time he came into town, he'd give me a call and we'd get together, and, and uh, anytime he was playing, he would he'd make sure I was behind stage with him. It's just been, it's been a great life. And then you've been talking about Roy Clark and that Roy friendship Clark, of yours. Yeah, yeah. Roy Clark, is wow. the, this is a guitar that I delivered. Uh, the heritage guitar that, that guitar I delivered. right there. Yeah, that's a heritage. Yeah, that's a Roy Clark model, and um, we put his name on the peghead and made a single cutaway, hmm. uh, of, like the one I have here that they built for me. Well, this is a single huh. cutaway. Yeah, who's this couple? This is a pretty well famous couple, Les mm -hmm. Paul and Mary Ford, hmm. and uh, I worked a lot with Les back in the old days. A lot of, a lot of secret behind the closed door. Hey, here's a picture. Is this? Yeah, is this my dad. This is my dad down in the southern part of Illinois, in West Frankfort, oh Benton, gosh. Illinois, down in that back back when he was mm -hmm. dreaming to come mm -hmm. to Kalamazoo. And tomorrow's out of sight, and it's sad to be alone. So help, help me make. make So I'm in front of my television and Green Valley Jamboree comes on. What did we witness? Well, uh, whenever the, the TV show came on, uh, we, my, one, one of the things that my dad always did was give people a chance to be on television. In other words, if a person called him, wrote a letter, they, uh, he would say, well, let me hear you, do a, do a number for me. And he'd listen if they were halfway good. He said, come on down. 
will put you on television. And a lot of people, I mean hundreds if not thousands of people over, that, over the, those years had a chance to be on television. And uh, Bob Rowe was one of them that my dad had a chance to, to say, hey, Bob, come on down and, and do a number with us. So he did and, and uh, of course he just fell in love with the whole, the whole music scene and um, uh, he's still, we're still picking together today. Uh, a lot of the artists from Nashville would stop by the TV show. Uh, we're going back to uh, Gabby Hayes and old well, Tex 19, Ritter. What, 19, because we're in the oh, 1900s. Oh, well, uh, uh, back in the 50s and the 60s. Um, but anybody that came to uh, Wing Stadium uh, or a fair, when they had a fair and they had somebody big, uh, they would uh, uh, come to the TV show, do a number, as they were passing through or playing someplace else, they'd always stop by. Well, howdy, neighbors. It's good to be with you once more. We got a lot to do, boy. Let's get going. Well, heading down my crooked road. What was it like working with your dad? Dad was a sort of thing, a uh, sort of person that had about 20 some songs out on Columbia Record and uh, everybody knew him. We had four and a half million available listeners to the TV show uh, for all those years. And any time that I was with him, I always felt like I was with, with something, somebody very important. Because no matter where he went, people were asking for his autograph and uh, uh, to be around him, and he was such a good person. Uh, he helped a lot of people, uh, not only uh, spiritual-wise, uh, friend-wise, friend uh, financial-wise, uh, and uh, everybody knew uh, that, uh, well, I'll tell you what, my mother had multiple sclerosis and uh, died in 78. She was a registered nurse, but she came down with that. And um, uh, she had the long, the long type of uh, disease. And my dad had an opportunity to travel on the road. At the time, his uh, home is where the herd is, and uh, was the biggest, almost as big as Elvis back then. It was a huge hit in the state of Michigan. And uh, but he, they, they asked him to to come to the Grand Ole Opry. He asked him to go on the road, and he said, No, I'm going to stay with Mom. You know, she's got a problem going to stick by her side. And most of the musicians that I know that have come to me later and said, we could have never have done that. Mm -hmm. you know. So that that's one thing I'm real proud of my dad for sticking by mom and helping her when her need was the most. Take me back to, I guess, what you got from this is well, a little tight. Well, dad needed a, a drummer in the band. So uh, I never took lessons on drums. I just got me a snare and a hi-hat and started beating on it, you know? And uh, luckily I was in time because a drummer has to be in time, has to have good rhythm. So uh, as a child, uh, I, I just grew up in a, in a musical family. And uh, with all these people coming in from Nashville, stopping by the house, going out to eat, I was just a part of that environment at a very, very young age. So whenever I would meet with the heavyweights in the industry, then I would be very comfortable and we'd get along just, just like brothers, just automatically, because I'm speaking the same language. And if they have a problem, I've pretty much been through like a guitar player. I've had musicians come all the way from Chicago to have me set up guitars and check out problems uh, because of the past experience that I've had. And that's what's made it fun for me. Hey, this says Johnny Cash. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, Johnny Cash's mm -hmm. guitar. I worked on that. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I've given guitars to little Jimmy Dickens and the Everly Brothers and Wilburn Brothers and and worked on Elvis's guitar. A lot of a lot of well, that's my that was my business back then. That's what I did. What's in here? That looks like a well, fancy. Well, we got well, what is in here? That's oh, this is a special guitar. This is the only picture in the world like this. Goodness. When I was working on Les Paul's guitar back in the old days, the Gibson, hmm. Les had sent his three guitars that he uses professionally in for work to be done and I worked on all three of them and I said while they're here I'm going to take a shot. I was doing a lot of the photography for yeah. Gibson back then and I said so that mm -hmm. one, that one and that one are, don't tell them what they're worth today but 
That's the only picture in the world like it. Well, and then this? I invented a what's gray this? card for photographers. Invention there. And I went to the Unicolor and Nikon School of Photography. And did a lot of the uh, um, books uh, for Gibson and the uh, catalogs and some catalogs for Heritage. The uh, gray cars, I was flying, I'm a pilot, and I was flying a Cessna 172 at about, I don't know, maybe six, 8,000 feet. Felt like I was running out of oxygen. And uh, by myself, and, I, mm -hmm. and the sun beat down on the panel, and it did not mm -hmm. glare in my eyes. And I said, oh, what, what that material is. And come to find out, it was microscopic rubber balls wow. uh, by 3M. So when I landed, the next couple of days, I went to Minneapolis, I think that's where they were at at the time, and got together with their engineers and developed a, a formula for that particular mm. color, 18% gray. Most photographers know that. And I put it on a, a white sheet of uh, plastic and started producing the gray card. And uh, they used that to set up uh, cameras in stores before they print. Right here in Kalamazoo. This There's, is priceless. This is uh, uh, Merle Travis and uh, Dorothy, his wife, and myself in the center, and um, his uh, Tom Bresh, another great guitar player, wrote this on there when I saw Tom. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had two guitars. I delivered one of these to Merle out in Oklahoma. He picked me up in his Yale Cadillac convertible with the bullhorns on it. His name's I, uh, on it. His name's yeah, on it. Yeah, it's uh, Marty Moore here in town did a lot of the uh, engraving huh. on the fingerboard. Very famous lady here in town. And Mrs. Nudie on a guitar that day. We uh, auctioned off for uh, cystic fibrosis. I think they raised over a million dollars that mm -hmm. weekend. So that was a big deal. The old Thanks for, for going through that with me. It was fun. So what's today like? I mean, today you go to work, you still play. Today, today uh, it's like a putting an old bull out the pasture, you know? It's like uh, I just come in and I say good morning and I say good evening and I go home and go to bed. No, <laughs> it's not quite that boring, but uh, I'm still uh, doing a lot of work with uh, Bob Rowe and Renaissance when doing the nursing homes. Do a couple of those a week for the last 28 years, I think. And I take most of my vacation time to do that and the company has been real great to, to let me off at that time. Um, and then uh, uh, I play uh, with another little group once in a while. Um, and uh, it's just play when I can, help other musicians here in town when they need a bass player, a guitar player, or a drummer, or whatever. Do it all over again? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I probably would like to do it sooner. Renwall, congratulations to you and Thank yours. Thank you very and, much. Uh, keep on strumming. Keep on a picking. <laughs> Yeah, and wear a smile on your face, it'd look funny anywhere else. <laughs> That's good. Well, we've had a lot of fun around here today, neighbors. We just hope that you've enjoyed it. So let us hear from you. Oh, remember me when the candlelight you gleam me. Remember me at the close of a long, long day. It will be so sweet when all alone I'm dreaming. Just to know that you remember me The sweetest song belongs to lovers in the gloaming The sweetest words belong to you and me Time's up, neighbors. Join us again next time for the Green Valley Jamboree. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Kalamazoo Lively Arts. Check out today's show and other content at WGVU.org. We leave you tonight with a nostalgic performance by the Green Valley Boys. I'm John Cope. Have a great night. All right, Randall, a little bit of music there.
It's the little things that make a house a home. There's a fire softly burning, suppers on the stove. And it's the light in your eyes that makes him warm. Oh, and hey, it's good to be back home again. tell you something it's good to hear you sing like that too Thank you. i bet you get a lot of requests support for kalamazoo lively arts is provided by the irving s gilmore foundation helping to build and enrich the cultural life of greater kalamazoo That's it, folks. <laughs>